So, um, what I'm going to moderate is actually not a pa panel discussion, nor is it a fish. So, uh, what I'm going to do is, is uh, split the discussion into four parts, and I'm going to call on people to the pack. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to the panel and have a discussion about that topic and then move on to another topic. And then for that uh, topic, we might have a different panel altogether or maybe uh, in part. Um, so first, um, to start off, I noticed that um, we did not have uh, a, a large portion of today's talks on spec. Uh, maybe that's telling, but um, maybe we ought to talk about it. So that's going to be our first topic. Uh, Sushil, who came last? Um, please come on stage. You'll be our first panelist. Uh, I will also like to invite uh, Jake, Sandy, Zach, and Tejas over to the stage. And a big round of applause for all these people. And a mic for them. A couple of mics would be useful, but yeah, two mics to pass around should be plenty. Great. Um, so it's great to have all of you here. Um, I presume uh, most of you do not need introductions, but I'm going to do that anyway. Um, Zach is a known name in the community. He's uh, written multiple projects um, that are open source libraries, Aleph, Manifold. You should go have a look at those things. Uh, Jake works at Outpace, is a consultant. I'm sorry? OK. He's. I, Presume he's helping us with well. Can somebody please move the podium a little to the side? That'd be helpful. Or that. And maybe turn the lights on? That'd be helpful. Cool. Um, so Jake works at Outpace. He's been driving closures since before 1.0. That's amazing. Uh, Tejas uh, has also been uh, doing closure for a long time, but maybe not so now. And we'll know why, maybe. Uh, Sandy has been driving closure for the last year and a half at Nilenso. He's worked with closure script, uh, spec, and, and such things. And social, I don't know much about you, so why don't you go ahead? Uh, Introduce yourself. Yeah, I, uh, so I work at WebEngage uh, with the data stack team. So I just recently joined WebEngage three months back, uh, learned closure, and was working on closure spec library for our data validation. OK, so first, I'm going to go ahead and pose the question, how do you use spec? Do you use it at all to Zach? I don't use it. <laughs> uh, but I have done some consulting work with companies that uh, are sort of trying it out as a way of validating data at the edges. Um, they've been using a couple of different serialization formats and uh, they weren't getting the sort of uh, narrowness in terms of the uh, data ranges and everything from those out of the box. And so they're playing around with it. Um, I don't think that they've used it enough for uh, them or me on their behalf to kind of say, uh, how effective it is for that role. I, I do think that the error messages leave something to be desired. That much I can say for sure. And I think that uh, the recurring response to that complaint, which is someone in the community can write uh, a function that fixes that, is underwhelming. Jake? Um, yeah, I agree with a lot of what Zach said. Um, but we have a little bit of spec in use at projects at Outpace. We have not brought it across all of our projects. Um, we were pretty heavy users of prismatic schema. So we already did have some data validation in place using kind of you know schema instead. Um, and I guess we haven't felt the need to convert to spec to go for it. Like schema's working fine for us. Um, yeah, I feel like I probably need to try it more. Um, like it is used a little bit, it's been useful, error messages are bad. So it seems like it's mostly ambivalent. Like, yeah, I guess it's there. I guess we can use it. I feel more compelled to use it because it's core. That's something I hear. Uh, Tejas, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I hate that uh, these two have covered most of my points. Um, <laughs> so how, how many people know what uh, spec does or have used prismatic schema? the first place. Yeah, that's about half the audience, so maybe you should introduce what it does first. Um, OK, can we have like a more brisk show of hands? Uh, spec. Uh, that's more. OK, schema. OK, that's roughly about the same audience. Um, to roughly or briefly introduce spec, 
Um, spec uh, is short for specification, potentially. It's something that Rich brought into the language, uh, or the language team brought in uh, to the language uh, rather recently. It's uh, in many ways a replacement for uh, schema in which you can, you can uh, um, write down what uh, type specifications are uh, for your uh, data structures and, and uh, more importantly, domain entities. And um, it has um, regex style specification for uh, the types it themselves. So it's, it's kind of a variation of using algebraic types but like some way to compose them uh, in addition to that. I'm probably not doing a really good job, but maybe go see the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so along that, I've never used uh, spec myself, but but at Quintype, we uh, we use uh, prismatic uh, schema quite a bit. And um, I actually wanted to give a little bit of a cautionary tale, which is what I was speaking to Srihari at uh, lunch. Like, um, I, I think these are very good for kind of type validations on, especially on API contracts. You can kind of validate that, you know, this is this should be a string or this should be an integer or like more complex things like length and stuff like that. But um, eventually when this is in your project, some very clever person will be, hey, um, you know, like I have this entire thing. I can actually do domain validations on this, right? Like for example, um, well, we're in the media publishing space. So we might say, you know, like, hey, I, I, I can assert over here that like, you know, a story that's being uh, published has a YouTube video in it. And, and at first, this will always seem like a, a great idea, but as Zach uh, mentioned, the errors are, are terrible, like at least for prismatic schema. In, in some cases, uh, prismatic schema, I've even seen it um, serialize a closure function and just say, uh, give back a S expression saying brackets not question mark or not, and then the name of the function itself. And so this becomes really jarring because you can't really show this to your users. But a developer kind of knows what's going on, but it's not really in a format that a machine can read it. So that was sort of my cautionary tale, which is that these tools are kind of great for validating, you know, like that data is sort of in the structure that you're looking for. But it's not really a replacement for kind of domain validations. It's not like, a, uh, to use a Rails example, it's not like a Rails validation. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So one thing is that uh, with spec, uh, at least the error messages do come as data, so they're machine consumable, if not user consumable, but I guess making them user consumable is is still an unsolved problem. Uh, so in some ways this might uh, kind of speak to, like um, you'll, you'll get very data consumable messages if you use the built-in validations, right? Like for example, to validate something's a string, um, yes, that kind of works both forward and backwards. You know that um, you know that it's not a string, and if something fails, you know it's because of this. But when you start getting into more complex things, such as relationships between fields in your data structure, you will eventually uh, end up writing a lambda, right? Or uh, basically a function which kind of takes your data structure as a whole and doesn't validate individual fields. You start building these more complex entities, and over there, by design, it's n no framework can kind of inspect your um, sort of code to figure out exactly what um, went wrong over there, and that's when this starts to break down. Sure, so no silver bullet, that's for sure. Uh, Sandy, you've used uh, spec in a closure script context as well. That's as, correct. Yeah, what are your thoughts so far? So, um, I think, uh, so I used spec in a closure script project. Uh, this was um, um, March, April 2017, right? Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, and uh, I, I used it uh, in conjunction with Reframe. Um, and their spec delivered, uh, I mean, we, we got a lot of value out of it uh, because uh, we were using it to validate our entire application state. Uh, and, um, you know, in the kind of uh, web application that we were writing, you know, it, there was just um, some CRUD and like some reporting UI. Uh, and um, most of the logic was mostly in doing state transitions, right? Uh, so um, if you have something like spec uh, that validates the state of your entire application whenever you change it, you end up catching uh, a lot of bugs because that's actually where the majority of your code sits. Uh, so that was uh, um, quite valuable for us. Uh, I think that um, sort of the flip side of this is uh, what they just touched upon, uh, uh, is that um, spec is quite ambitious in, in what it tries to do. Uh, so, you know, on the one hand, right, you can um, write arbitrary predicates and uh, use them as specs, right? You can just, they're just functions. You can write um, whatever code you like and validate um, in whatever manner you want. Um, but on the other hand, uh, 
<clears throat> the the other uh, sort of selling point of spec is that you you get all this leverage out of spec. You write the spec, uh, you you get um, data generators, you get generative tests, uh, and people are actually um, in the community trying to write um, even more things, generate more things from your specs. Um, but that's going to be difficult to do if uh, your specs are code, if your specs are um, predicates that you've written yourself, as opposed to just pure data. Uh, so um, I kind of think that one. I think that one problem is that these two ideals are a little bit at odds with each other, right? Uh, it's going to be difficult uh, to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, it's interesting that you mention um, tests in concern with spec, and that is something that uh, got added to core as well, along with spec, which is generative tests. So, do you find yourself doing generative tests more because spec? So, uh, no, no. We mainly use uh, hello, hello. Keep it closer. Yeah. So we mainly uh, use the spec tool as a uh, only for validation, uh, because uh, like when when you write spec, so it, it's not the uh, perf perfect uh, form of a data. So if you can consider the universal set of data, so spec uh, is a super set of your correct data. So if you want to try out generative testing, you might not come up with the, the correct data always. So uh, sometimes uh, some test cases will fail, like you might not, might not come up with enough uh, correct test cases. Zach? Uh, I, I do a lot of generative tests, but not with spec. And I'll just add that. Uh, it's often very desirable for you to kind of skew where the samples come from. Um, for instance, you know, you can say this is an integer, but you might want to say, oh, I want this to be an integer that's sort of towards the lower end of the spectrum, or I want to go and uh, have, you know, up to the highest levels and sort of have it be uniformly spread across there. And so in those cases, uh, spec is not going to capture that, right? And so hand rolling generators is always going to be a better solution if you have sort of complex data. And it's nice that you get that out of the box, right? That you don't have to do it in some cases, but uh, the the sort of bi-directionality of the validation and generation is always going to be kind of uh, not as effective as doing both uh, in a sort of purpose-built uh, way. Cool. Um, so leading up from that, I'd like to ask, uh, what does your test pyramid normally look like? Uh, is it all generative? Like, what part of it is generative? Do you still write example tests? Um, and like, I find that in the in in the closure ecosystem in general, uh, there seems to be um, a, a tendency to write more integration tests and lesser unit tests. Do you find that true? Um, uh, it's it's true of mine. I don't know. I'm not. I, I can't speak for everyone, but. Uh, you know, certainly if I'm testing an API, I prefer to have a real client speaking across like the, the local network to it because that's the easiest way for me to know that the entire thing is working. And uh, it's generally just as easy to generate those examples as it would be to generate others. Uh, the only drawback being there for generative testing that it's more expensive to do each of the individual tests. So I tend to have the example tests be uh, very heavy duty integration tests and have the generative things be a little bit uh, deeper into the code so that I can go and cover more of the, uh, the input space. Jake, I know that you said you have a lot of thoughts on testing. <laughs> you should write tests. No, um, I think I probably have a reasonably healthy mix of integration and unit tests. Um, like I, I use unit tests a lot to kind of explore the space as I'm trying to solve a problem. Um, and then often those kind of stick around. Um, so like I, I think that using things like test refresh or auto expect, like I can get nearly as fast as feedback as I do in the REPL, if I'm playing around with something. And I, I still use the REPL heavily, but that also means I kind of have tests that stick around while exploring that. Um, I also find integration tests it's like super useful to have because it lets you know like is the whole thing working, right? Um, generative testing, I'm not a pro at it. Like I do have some, I've written them, and they've definitely caught bugs where I've had it. And kind of like to build on what Zach was saying earlier, the spec with the generative test, these the generative tests I'm writing, spec would not be helpful. Um, like that's just not. I guess that's not the type of test case I'm generating. We're just like controlling the inputs would actually be 
thing. Um, it's more like you have this like custom data structure. You need to have all these different operations happen, and, like do this invariance hold no matter the order of things, right? Um, so yeah, kind of like I guess I have a mix, um, and I feel like the type of projects I'm working on, we tend to have a mix of unit and integration. Maybe some of the unit tests a little bit larger than a traditional unit test. Um, so that's there. Cool. Tejas? Uh, I'm probably going to be the minority on this. I, I love unit tests. I'm, um, I guess this might be because languages I've come to from be before Clojure, like a lot of focus on things like test-driven development and stuff. I, I like to do that in, in Clojure as well. I find it helps me kind of um, get some clarity on what I expect this function to, you know, take as inputs and what it expects to come out as outputs. Um, I think at least I like a, uh, 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 well, I like to think about things through a fairly traditional test pyramid, mostly because like writing unit tests is easy because it, they're very small. They they do things, and here I define the unit um, the unit test as you know everything outside of my system is outside the unit, but everything within. So it, I won't do like a lot of mocking or anything. I won't even mock the database, but um, um, yeah, I, I'll use uh, unit tests a lot. Um, functional tests are a little bit harder for me to write in Clojure because um, well at least. Um, typically, what you would want in a test is to kind of go do things and then kind of roll back your entire database and stuff like that. And while these things can be done in Clojure, they're far more difficult when you know you're calling out through an HTTP client and like kind of testing all that. So, what sort of ends up happening is um, we sort of structure our uh, namespaces into two classes, uh, into two sets. So, like for example. Uh, the entry point to HTTP might be like you know your server or your resources namespace, and then that will maybe be like three, four lines of codes, a couple of ring handlers, and then immediately call out to a domain namespace. And once I'm in my domain namespace, I'm pretty confident that everything here is like, well, has a very non high. Huh? Non-IO. No, it still, it still might be IO, but it, I know it's very heavily unit tested. Everything that was IO, if I was testing that particular thing, might be, might be stubbed out. Like um, uh, in particular, like you know, if it's making calls to a different service or something like that. But I, I, I'm very confident that any namespace that starts with the word domain or anything below that, like maybe database, these things are all very heavily tested. Nice. What do you guys think? Any any concrete thoughts or anything you want to express? So, um, although I haven't been writing a, a, a lot of closure since um, maybe May uh, last year, I've recently started doing that again. Um, but. Uh, <clears throat> If, and, and I actually haven't written uh, generative tests professionally, although I, I do know how to. Um, but if, if I were to pick up a new project today and um, see how to go about testing it, um, I would probably uh, try to write generative tests uh, at the unit level. Uh, so try to generatively, try to gener generatively test uh, pure functions. I know that um, some people uh, uh, maybe like to write generative integration tests as well. Um, I feel like there are a lot of drawbacks to that, uh, particularly since uh, Clojure's test.check um, isn't really as uh, as full featured as, say, uh, Erlang's Quick Check, uh, and it doesn't have the facilities for testing stateful things that Erlang's Quick Check does. So um, you end up with generative tests that are like super slow and um, don't. And in my opinion, at least, they might not necessarily provide you with a lot of value. Uh, so that I would sense I, I've heard of um, multiple cases where people dial down their generative tests because it takes too much CI time, and I've also heard people shying away from generative tests because they're state, and um, they don't know how to write properties that involve state. Yes, it's it's not um, very easy to come up with those, but more importantly, I don't think uh, the library or the framework provides capabilities to deal with that in a nice way. Yep. Any additional thoughts? Any closing thoughts to that? I, I think we should maybe move on uh, to another topic. Um, I think a lot of my testing philosophy kind of lines up. There's a book, I think, called Growing Object Oriented Software Through Tests, or something like that. Um, and admittedly, it says object oriented, but it applies to lots of things. I highly recommend that book when it comes to testing um, and kind of like growing a system. I think it applies to Clojure as much as other languages. Cool, thanks. So um, I guess that's it for spec and testing. So uh, thank you guys so much. I'd like to keep Zach on, but the rest of you uh, can join the audience back. It's and uh, I would like or... to bring back, uh, bring on stage uh, Shantanu and Antonio. 
to the next uh, topic of discussion. Huh? Thank you, guys. Um, so this, um, I'm hoping, will be a discussion about um, people who create libraries. These three people, and, I've, and they have done a lot of work in, in uh, creating new libraries and contributing back to the community. So um, one question I have to you guys to kickstart uh, this discussion would be, uh, what makes a meaningful contribution uh, to the community, or what makes a good library? Um, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, so I mean, I think that there's there's a cost of adoption for every new user. And so you need to make sure that the time that they spend uh, learning it uh, gives them enough leverage. So I mean, I, I find myself kind of alternately kind of surprised and like amused by the like single function JavaScript kind of uh, ecosystem because Oftentimes, you're spending a lot of time sort of learning the API, and at the end of it, you have one new function to use. And I mean, I guess if it's like left pad, that's easy. But like in a lot of other cases, it's it's less trivial. And so I think that what you'd be looking for is that the uh, the API surface area is much smaller than sort of what's underneath it, so that you know, in return for actually learning the API and internalizing how it's meant to be used, uh, you're getting back a meaningful chunk of new functionality. Right. So powerful APIs. Uh, I guess uh, meaningful APIs to a powerful library. That's sort of what you're getting. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, just just like make sure that people feel like there's you know something at the end of the tunnel that like is worth getting to. Um, Antonio, I would say really optimizing for the newcomer experience and having very very good docs um, make for a meaningful contribution. As long as the libraries, I mean, most libraries exist, or most libraries that people use will be good anyway. Yeah. Be because if you have the community, mm -hmm. you'll, they will make the library good. But to get the community around the library, you, you, you got you to gotta have a very good getting started experience. That makes a lot of sense. So I think a lot of us uh, tend to pull out libraries in our projects, but we don't take the time to write out a readme or enough docs for people to understand it or even contribute. So I guess that's quite important. Shantanu, you've written a bunch. What do you think? Um, I, in fact, agree with uh, what, what Zach and Antonio said, uh, that, that, that the libraries, in fact, uh, are very useful when, when they, they deliver long-term value. Uh, and when I say long-term value, it also means that, that once, once uh, any user adopts a library or a framework, they, they, they're sort of invested in that. So the investment has to pay off in, in the long term. Um, so, so while it, it is important that, that the ramp up is easy, it is also important that the abstractions are very well thought so that the investment pays off well uh, over, over time. That makes sense. But um, so I, as a follow-up question to that, how do you know when you have a good abstraction? Or how do you know? <laughs> well, I don't want to make the question as generic and like, repeat Zach's entire talk. Um, I can just get started. I mean, uh... <laughs> uh, what I want to get to is this, right? There is fragmentation in the closure library ecosystem, right? Like, um, when would I choose to contribute to an existing library versus create my own? Like, the I find this uh, common among closurists that. Like that one moment when you find that one small thing that you nitpick about the library, you just go write your own thing from scratch, right? So uh, is that just an NIH amongst the e in the ecosystem that's prevalent, or like what's a good way to go ahead and build a meaningful um, ecosystem of libraries that actually uh, you know grow up to this uh, long-term meaningfulness as Shantanu expressed. Uh, okay, uh, so I mean, one thing that regularly bothers me about the kind of uh, you know uh, announcement of a new project is when you go to the README and the README tells you all the ways that the library is great and why you should use it, and spends no time telling you why you might not want to use it. 
And uh, I think that this kind of stems from, again, a very similar misunderstanding of what an abstraction is, where it's kind of seen as a sign of weakness to admit what your thing is bad at and to not acknowledge that all abstractions are bad at something because it's a fact that they've focused on a narrower thing than all the problems that makes them useful, right? And so um, I think that that contributes in the general sense to why people will find the one like problem and then bail because the library author who is the authority on what the thing is and isn't good at hasn't given them any hints, right? And so they're very uh, attuned to anything that hints that this might not be worth their time. Um, but I mean, I think that the other thing you touched on, which is that there is sort of the Lisp curse where everybody kind of wants to roll their own is absolutely part of our community's kind of DNA. and. Uh, I, I spoke a little bit at the conj about this as like an unsession, and I, I didn't really have any answers. I just think that it's something that we should probably acknowledge. And uh, you know, individually, we might want to second guess when we bail on an existing project to go roll around. Do you guys have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, that is very well said. Um, uh, so, so the only only point that I would like to add is that that the, that the closure is, is a fairly young language compared to the other more, more established languages. Uh, so, so it is important for the evolution uh, of, of good, good libraries that, that there are many experiments. And, 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 and without, without uh, uh, I mean, I mean, thorough experiments, we will not have really good libraries coming out and, and establishing themselves as, as, the, uh, as, as the way to go. So, so the experimentation uh, is, I think, good for, for a young language like Clojure. Uh, and, um, uh, and at the same time, um, I mean, the evolution is, uh, is is required as well. That makes sense. I mean, experimentation is important, um, but I mean that does lead to a lot of code being put out there, and then a confusion to like newcomers, most importantly. Uh, but I also want to call out. I don't think we are the like. I don't think it's unique to the closure community. Um, I was at a conference recently where the entire talk was how. Um, Haskell has this problem all over. Like every single problem in Haskell has like a ton of libraries to choose from, and that's a problem too. Antonio, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, should I create my own library or should I contribute to one? Yeah, I. I don't think I have much more uh, to offer uh, other than what they said. However, I would say that there's a big difference between experimentation and uh, stewardship, mm -hmm. and so you may experiment something, but then if you get new users, you're going to be stuck maintaining it. And, and, and that, that is really something that you want, you, you want to, con I, I guess, consider before putting something out there. Because like, it's very good to experiment by yourself. But once you, once you put it out there and you, you I mean, your, your, your library may gather users from like overnight. So you, I mean, if, if you're doing that, you must be prepared to to, to accept the consequences, which might be you're going to be stuck maintaining it forever. That makes sense. And you guys managed to hold this down despite uh, full-time jobs, I presume. So like, kudos to that. <laughs> uh, so one last question I do want to ask uh, is, what would you have to say uh, to the starry-eyed enthusiasts here about uh, you know, a library that they want to write out, or um, if they want to contribute to Clojure, um, either the language or the community or uh, a library, what is, what is a piece of advice that you would give? Um, I mean, just to like quickly add something onto the previous topic, um, something that uh, I would love to see is more of an attempt for someone to just adopt a position of authority, Cognitect or whomever else, as to what is a good set of default libraries to use, given that there are a lot of solutions to the same problem. I think that this is a major issue in terms of people first joining the community because it's very confusing and having just same defaults. They don't need to be the best library. They don't need to be the only library that someone would ever want to use, but just something that isn't going to go and you know has someone who's actively maintaining it, has some reasonable set of decisions behind them. And you know, if six months in they have to go and switch, you know, so be it. But at least they don't have this kind of initial blind kind of uh, just wandering around the, uh, the Clojars sort of website. Uh, to answer your other question, um, every library I've ever done was because I wasn't 
I didn't know very much about the thing that I was writing, um, and I wanted to learn more. And I found that uh, being worried that people are going to uh, see me do something stupid is a really great motivator to learn a topic. And so, um, I mean, what in off something that you think you're going to get bored with, but uh, biting off sort of something that seems almost a little bit too much is a really great way to learn. Um, at least it has been for me. So, you know, uh, don't, don't be too modest in your goals. Great. Shantanu, do you have a piece of advice? Uh, so, I, so, so the, what, what I, I, I'd like to share with the audience here is that, that, that you should, you should uh, look at libraries or frameworks um, to, to really solve a problem well for, for yourself first. Um, so that once, once you are convinced about, about what, what it does for you, the, 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 the kind of value that it brings to you, that would probably replicate for, for, for somebody else as well. Uh, and then evaluate it for yourself first, and if it makes sense to you, you should, you should try, try to try to spread the value, and that is how the whole Clojure community will grow and then the adoption will grow. Uh, and and, uh, and closure closure is, is a very very well thought language. At the same time, we also need to make the whole tooling ecosystem and and the, um, and and we, we need to make it make it friendly and, and useful for for the people trying it for for the first time or newly. So so uh, so, so 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 for closure to be useful to those people, it, it is important that we see the value and then spread the value. Neat. What are your thoughts? I guess, uh, I guess my advice will be a little bit more uh, technical. Um, so if you're just starting out with a, a, a closure or any language, just write something every day. Just write code every day and get better at it. Uh, That's great advice. And also read some, probably. Oh yeah, and, and, oh, yeah, and read a lot of code. More than you write. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you guys so much. A round of applause for these people, people. You guys can join the audience. <laughs> you can let go of you guys now. So for the next uh, discussion, uh, I don't have much of a segue. I really tried, to be honest. But I'm going to invite uh, Sudha, uh, Namrita, Supriya, Deepa, and Mohit onto the stage. Uh, so yeah, you can applaud. <laughs> And as these people come onto the stage, I'm just going to take the time to introduce them. Uh, Sudha is sorry. Yeah, sure. So Sudha is in her third year of engineering, if I'm not wrong. She studies in uh, Anna University, Chennai. Um, Namrita works at Nalenso. She's been writing closure for the last um, month or so. November. Two months, three months. Okay, and. Um, uh, Supriya works at ThoughtWorks, um, which is a rather uh, forward company in terms of, um, you know, a lot of things. Uh, Deepa works at Nilenso. Uh, she does, um, like, sales hiring operations at Nilenso and a lot of things, really. Um, and, well, Mohit, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> um, I don't know how to introduce myself. Um, I guess I'm just a... A closure enthusiast who was lucky enough to be a professional programmer in closure at Helpshift, and that's how I got into this community. Um, and I also helped organize uh, the first two editions of Inclosure. Cool. So, um, three of you uh, were at the workshop yesterday. I guess all of us were at the workshop yesterday, but you two learned closure at the workshop yesterday. Would you uh, mind telling the audience a little bit about your experience at the workshop? And like, what is that one thing that you like about closure or dislike about closure? You just press the power button on the left. One on the left. Long press. Go ahead. Keep it close. Uh, yeah, I was at the workshop yesterday and I must say I had no prior experience in closure and I really enjoyed the workshop yesterday. Oh. 
so yesterday uh, like workshop was very nice like uh, i already know uh, i was knowing the closure but still i learned uh, some more new things so it was real helpful yeah so namrata actually was a tutor at the workshop yesterday um w what is like the one thing that you like about closure and one thing that you dislike about closure uh, uh, i'll start with what i dislike there are there are lots of components available out there in closure but uh, there is very little documentation as to how you go about connecting those components which was the point where uh, that i struggled with when i started off working with it but i guess it's one of the language nuance and you get used to it after a point of time and i think that's the learning curve in closure um about what i like i come from an from an academic background as in uh, we did a lot of haskell in college and uh, we did a lot of category theory functional programming and stuff so for me to transition uh, from my last job where i was doing php to this was not really much of a hassle because there are lots of inherent uh, Fun functional programming concepts available in uh, closure uh, and also i am very fascinated with macros i still have no idea how it works under the hood i've looked at lots of documentations lots of blog posts so if anybody has a good resource which hints towards how macros work internally please point me towards it thank you <laughs> Um so um like I said I don't have a particular segue into this but I really do want to discuss this um so I think we can all agree that uh, gender equality in the industry is pretty abysmal right um at least in most companies that uh, I know even even the most forward ones um there are there's probably like one woman when there are 10 men in the office and that's probably the ratio that uh, most people have seen around also so i want to ask um maybe i'll start with you deepa what has your experience been uh, has the ratio been this bad everywhere like what is an example of one thing um of, of inequality that that you'd like to express like what's that one thing that's obviously bad and in, in like you know people here should know that it's actually that bad I actually started out in i banking and uh, the gender ratio was pretty poor there as well. Um I studied engineering wasn't stellar in college either. So I think um the first step is probably acknowledging that the biases are real. Um and that this is systemic. Um so it's not an easy problem to solve. and often um you've internalized these stereotypes to such an extent that um you fail to recognize them even within yourself or when you are being um discriminated against and you know take small steps to correcting that in your everyday life um if you don't have any women in your company speak to women and ask them what it will take um to bring them in um if you don't have women at in upper management positions ask women in other positions um to influence policy and strategy um basically um give women a voice when it comes to making decisions and we'll get there hopefully sooner rather than later and uh, that's a lot of insight so, like i only asked you for one bad example but like you're telling us how to fix this that's the uh, nice. that, that's actually not what i'm saying at all because i don't think it's that simple but what do you think we should be doing to fix it like what's one thing speak to more women and listen i guess that's pretty much what we're doing now uh, let's listen to suda 
I I have no experience in the industry, so I would like to tell my perspective, which many of you might or might not relate to. Uh, so the gender ratio is actually equal in many colleges. I can say that uh, uh, sure for sure. Uh, I think the stats would agree to it, uh, except for some institutes like the IITs. And uh, let's not get to it, into it right now. But uh, when it comes to events like the ICPC or programming contests or hackathons, we don't see as much involvement from the women folk, uh, even though the gender ratio is the same in CS majors. Uh, and I must also add, there are a lot of stuff going on which encourage women to get into tech. Like, for instance, Google has a Women Tech Makers Scholarship uh, there's a dedicated uh, branch to promote women in tech of the ACM, which is called ACM Women. And uh, even Qualcomm has a very generous scholarship for women in tech who are students. But the thing is, I've observed not many people know about this. And even uh, some of my male friends, I must highlight some, uh, just get annoyed with this and say, like, why do you get to enjoy all these leverages while we have to put in a lot more efforts than you have to? Uh, and even, I wouldn't say this is an unfair advantage. This is an advantage, but not many people take advantage of this, and this should continue until uh, we get to a state where we don't need this, and there are enough women in tech. And I must say, we should uh, make uh, people aware right from a young age uh, how rewarding a career in tech could be. And I'm assuming it is rewarding it because is. I don't have any experience. <laughs> it is very rewarding. Um, Namrata, yeah, thank you. But, but thanks a lot for that. Um, like, thanks a lot for expressing that. It, it takes a lot to come up on stage and, and say a lot of these things. And I'm sure this is like super valuable. Namrata? I have a very uh, uh, different perspective. Uh, so, so I think somewhere uh, you need to stop with the casual sexism, honestly. Uh, the humor is the biggest thing which people say, Are mazak hai. it's just a joke. Let's send women to kitchen, it's just a joke. It's not a joke after a point of time, okay? Like, uh, that needs to stop. And it doesn't have to be tech. Uh, related or just confined to a technical space. In general, when you when you're indulging in casual sexism, you're actually promoting those biases more and more. So maybe that's where people need to start drawing a line. Just watch what you speak, watch how you think, and then the society on whole becomes more accepting. And uh, if you go. Uh, just tech specific, I think there are lots of initiatives which promote uh, women to get involved. Uh, I was never aware of them e even during my college or even after coming out of it. So I actually had to slog my way to where I am right now, make, make myself comfortable in this uh, industry. But it's not very welcoming uh, if, if you just start out without any support. So, uh, women actually can make use of that support, get themselves established, and actually be at good places with equal, um, you know, salaries and good designations, everything. It's all possible. You just need to make use of that support which is available. So, somewhere, women also need to step up and ta take that initiative of of using the resources which are out there and society in general just needs to be a little more welcoming and you know stop creating all these biases subconsciously. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks a lot for that Namrita. Um, so Priya, do you have any thoughts on what Namrita just said or even your own experiences, right? Like you work at ThoughtWorks, ThoughtWorks is pretty forward and like I don't think, um, like I was talking to you the other day and you expressed that uh, like, you don't feel unequally treated at ThoughtWorks. Uh, so ThoughtWorks might probably be doing something right. Um, yeah. What are some of those things? Like, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking such a long time to Hello. explain myself. I just want to give enough context for people to understand. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, so as everybody has uh, expressed the inequalities, but I think uh, uh, the thing uh, which we need for, as a woman, like they need the opportunity, right? So in ThoughtWorks, I feel uh, like currently also, right, we are doing uh, women specific drives, like there will like recruitment only for women, so that uh, more women can come to. Uh, uh, come to organization. So uh, in thought was I don't uh, feel that there is a inequality. Everybody, everybody gets the chance to work on anything. Like there are women which are driving projects. There are women which are driving actually office kind of thing. So so in each position where the men are there, uh, there are women. So every, uh, like there is no inequality of giving roles as well. It's just that whoever is, uh, have that quality is getting that uh, work. So that thing I think uh, ThoughtWorks is uh, managing pretty well. Yeah, so maybe that's something we can all learn. Maybe we should do uh, women hiring drives. Yeah. That's something for us to think about. Uh, Mohit, what are your thoughts? Okay. Um, so the last couple of years, um, I've started taking uh, feminism seriously. Um, and uh, as I did that, I uh, realized that I grew up with a lot of inherent biases, uh, which I didn't even know I had. Um, the way I thought, the way I spoke, the way I behaved. Um, I, I must have been, um, you know, I don't, I don't know what the word is, but uh, I have been fortunate to be around uh, some really strong women uh, who are really articulate and who've educated me. Um, one of them being my friend Niketa. Um, and, and she's told me some really interesting stories. One of the stories that she told me is, uh, uh, for example, when you go to a restaurant um, as a, just a single girl, you get treated a certain way. If you go with uh, one man, like a girl and a guy, you get treated a different way. Uh, if you go as a group of girls, you get treated a different way. If you go as a mixed group, you get treated a different way. And that was perspective that I just did not have. Like, I just walk into a restaurant, have fun, and come out. I don't feel any difference in, in how I am treated. So um, I think uh, I'd just like to reiterate what Deepa said. Talk to women. Um, have empathy. I mean, everyone's fighting their own battles. We are all fighting our own battles. Um, but, but just open your hearts, open your minds, and listen. Uh, and I think that's the least we can do. Um, um, I think in terms of what companies can do, I think Nilenso is setting a great example by having uh, men's to leave, right? Like you can just write a mail saying, I'm not coming because I have cramps, and that is amazing. I think that's a great initiative. Uh, and I wish more companies would do things like that. So, yeah. Well, uh, this has been quite revolutionary and quite useful, I'm sure, not just for me, but like a lot of the audience here. But unfortunately, we are a bit short on time, and I do want to take this discussion forward, but from another perspective. So I would uh, like, like to have Deepa uh, on the panel still, but the rest of you can join the audience. And I would like to invite um, Steve, BG, and... Uh... Yeah, apologies for not pausing for that. Um... So, BG, Steve, and Shantanu, also, actually. So, um, these people are in a position where they can hire people. They do hire people on a day-to-day -day basis. Actually, even Jake, I believe he said uh, he does a lot of hiring. So, uh, if anyone else uh, who does a lot of hiring would like to contribute on, this, on, on the topic, please uh, put your hand up and, like, we'll send you a mic or something. So what I want to ask is, uh, now that we've heard them, um, to some extent, like we have a certain understanding, um, what do you think we can do to fix uh, gender, equ gender equality from a hiring perspective? And maybe even from a hiring perspective for like, w when hiring closurists? Is it for me? Okay. You can start. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to quickly introduce you uh, so that people know who you guys are. Um, BG uh, worked at HelpShift for the last eight years and has um, uh, initiated many a closurist. I don't know why I'm using the word initiated so often. <laughs> um, 
but but yeah, uh, BG has hired a lot of closurists. Steve and Deepa have uh, hired people at Nilenso and have had uh, a lot of experience hiring people outside of Nilenso as well. Uh, Shantanu uh, similarly at Conquer, Jake similarly at Outpace and DRW and other companies before I presume. So BG. Cool. Uh, again, I think I don't really have a clear or easy answer to this question, but I can maybe briefly talk about what we try to do at HelpShift. Uh, ultimately, it's all about creating a very inclusive culture. Uh, we actually have a lot of female closure programmers at HelpShift. Unfortunately, none of them are here today, uh, but <laughs> that probably says something, I guess. Uh, but uh, we at HelpShift have tried to create a culture which is very sort of gender inclusive and uh, and as it's about casual sexism and all these things right so we have never really tolerated these things in the company and the kind of way how we talk to uh, our uh, teammates whether they are male or female or maybe whichever gender gender is a spectrum right so uh, we, i mean we've always tried to make make sure that people are given the right kind of opportunities and uh, as deepa said that if we don't have a senior uh, PM, people uh, who are female in the company maybe talk to other females in the team and get some opinion. Uh, HelpShift is a very unique company. We have a lot of females. Our CEO is also a woman, so that's also a thing. So uh, I, I won't say that I have completely succeeded in my effort because I think the programmer female ratio is still, I think, around uh, 20 percent. Uh, but still, I think uh, it's better than the industry average. Uh, to really fix this problem, I think it's a much larger sort of effort over a long period of time, and only companies can't really change overnight. It's society also, I think, needs to take some steps. Uh, but like, what do you think is that one thing uh, which is a larger effort that we all need to do? I mean, yeah, we all understand um, at some point that it's it's a larger issue, right? It's not just relevant to our company. Um, like I know that at Delhi, so we don't get that many female applicants, right. right? But so we do understand it's a larger issue. But so, like, what is one thing we can do to fix that larger issue? I think the first thing that we must do is, as, as they say, charity begins at home in the sense that we need to first educate ourselves about the biases that we already harbor in our minds. Like, how do we interview people? Uh, depending on their gender, for example. That's a very important thing as well. Sometimes you may think that, oh, she is not qualified, and or maybe there could be some random reason, which ultimately is probably coming from a seat of some sort of bias. That can also happen. And uh, it's also about understanding that sometimes we probably need to uh, give them a leg up in the sense that provide uh, more support in terms of whether it is encouragement or, or mentorship and uh, show them the career path that they can, you know, uh, get to, and uh, encourage them to be ambitious as well. And uh, I think people are anyway smart; they they will, they understand at the end of the day. Thanks, BG. Steve, Deepa. Um, <laughs> so, so I think uh, that there's actually a flaw in the question. Um, so the question is kind of what what is the one thing that we can do to solve this problem? No, not as the one thing. What okay. is one thing? I guess I should rephrase that to say what is one thing right. that we can do? Um, it, so I think it it maybe helps to take uh, a step back and um, and ask that question in a bunch of different contexts um, and to frame uh, the context for yourself every single time. Um, so Deepa was making a suggestion. She said. Um, take a moment and observe your, your every interaction, right? The things that you're saying, the, your body language, the way that you're behaving day to day, small, tiny, moment to moment things. Um, that's a very different context than uh, what is something that we as an organization can do collectively, what sort of a choice that we can make. Um, so if you were to look at these two contexts, one is probably the narrowest moment that you have in the day um, when you smile at somebody, what are your intentions, right? Um, do, do you want them to feel good about it? Do you want them to feel intimidated? Um, these things are really small and add up a lot. Um, and we're doing them more or less wrong constantly. Um, on the other end of the spectrum uh, is uh, actually a lot of the stuff that ThoughtWorks is doing. 
Um, so they, they don't just have uh, female hiring drives. They, they actually have had uh, a repeated program of going out and finding women who do not even work in the tech industry at all. Um, so people who have had other careers who have wound down or who have had children and now those children have grown up and they're looking for another career and actively pursue those women and say, hey, look, it's 2016 or 2017 or whatever time. Um, it's neither of those anymore, I realize. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, essentially everybody in the modern generation has multiple jobs, if not multiple career paths in their lifetime these days. So you can be uh, an accountant in your early life and a mother or father in your midlife and you could be a closure programmer in your late life, and we'll give you an opportunity to do that. But that takes a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of initiative. Um, and I think kind of the bridge between these two contexts and the context between them um, is, uh, is something else that uh, quite a few people have mentioned, which is uh, bias, and in particular cognitive bias. Um, and if you're looking for a name, the best name that I can think of um, to actually research this, uh, it would be Linda Rising. Um, so Linda, I see nobody writing it down, but you should totally write it down. She's the best. Um, so <laughs> Linda Rising um, is, is a fantastic speaker and author, and uh, she's done a lot of work on retrospectives. So just the act of looking back uh, on a project or looking back on your time at a company. Um, but she insists that retrospective is useful at all scales. So at the end of the day, how many of us take five minutes when we get home to think, oh, how did that day go? Like, why don't I just walk back through my day and see what, how it went? Um, and so she's, she's written a lot on retrospectives, um, but more recently she's written a lot on cognitive biases and not necessarily uh, in the space of feminism or women in the workplace, uh, but just cognitive bias in general. And she's written it in a very beautiful way um, and given a, a TED talk that's also very beautiful that does a fantastic job of making you as the watcher or the reader realize just how deep your cognitive biases are. And everyone in this room has deep, horrifying cognitive biases that we all just kind of take for granted. Uh, Deepa was mentioning this, that you can, you can take a moment and you can re-examine these things and you can do it constantly and continuously day after day. Um, and if we do that, hopefully, we can take our organizations to the other end uh, where we're doing things like ThoughtWorks does, where, where they're pursuing uh, women into bringing them into the workplace actively um, and try to come up with other creative methods of solving these problems uh, as the problems themselves change over time. Thanks, Steve, I guess. I, I don't know how to reply to that. Uh, like, thanks for that. Uh, Shantanu, Deepa, uh, any of you? Go ahead. Uh, so we had some great points mm -hmm. put, put together by, by BG and, and Steve. Uh, uh, the, um, so in welcoming women to the workplace, it, it is definitely important that we remove uh, in any kind of bias that we may have. And it's even more important to be aware of what, what kind of subtle biases that we may or the, um, that, we, that we may may, may um, may may have that that we we may or may not be aware of. Uh, so luckily SAP in fact imparts training with us um, about about how how to how how to how to how to extensively remove any any kind of you know you know uh, hiring hiring biases and and uh, in, in fact two of our women engineers are right here in the on the um, in the conference uh, uh, and then beside that. Uh, the way that we uh, usually take our hiring is that, that we, we welcome every, everybody. Um, we don't, in fact, um, differentiate between, between, between women versus men candidates. But, but when, when uh, we find two to equal participants, we, we um, tend to prefer women. So that is kind of, kind of our hiring, hiring policy. Um, but but beside that we don't um, we don't differentiate that that we, we have to, um, to to do this or that. So. Um, 
I think the question was, what is the one thing not we can one, do? Not the one, one thing. One of the things uh, we can do. One of the things, um, yeah. To kind of improve the situation. Sorry, I didn't mean to pick on you. <laughs> but um, I think um, a lot of panel discussions around serious topics such as these um, basically touch upon, you know, family, upbringing, professors, mentors, organizations, colleagues, behavior, um, appropriate and inappropriate. Um, and I think we've sort of touched upon all of those uh, more or less. Um, I just want to say that um, we've spoken a lot about the biases that men have, but women have these biases too, um, and about themselves. Um, so when there are opportunities to network, um, we shy away also. And that's something we should um, watch out for and stop doing. Jake? I don't know if I really have any solution for this. Like, I think looking at, like, I'm like reflecting on my career. I think at the company I worked at that had the biggest ratio of female to male programmers, that was about 10%. And like, we felt kind of good about that. I mean, still kind of shitty, but like, that was like shock. Like, Compared to like previous company, that was like nine times better. I don't know, like, and that's like that's really sad. Um, like it, having like that slight more diversity on the teams was great for the teams. Like it, I, it did feel different. It was better. Like those teams were better than I've been on before. Um, I think part of the problem that we had recruiting uh, non males is that like we basically recruited people we've worked with before, and like we've only worked with other males, like that's who you can refer. Um, so I think like if you're trying to hire for teams, you probably need to go outside like your usual like referral based hiring type thing, try to like find some other sources. Um, otherwise like you'll never get a better ratio than you've ever had before. Makes sense. Um, I would actually wanted to respond to what Deepa was saying because um, I think I think it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I think we've had uh, on multiple occasions, this reflection within Nalenso over the past four years. Um, initially, for the first couple of years, uh, we would attend a conference like this, um, and we would get involved in a conversation about diversity, and uh, we would usually be pretty proud about the fact that, um, as Shantanu was saying, we would, we would sort of argue, well, we don't differentiate between men and women. We, we treat them both the same way. Um, and we, we had uh, one strong developer in the Verita and one strong, uh, I mean, Deepa is more or less our CEO. If we had that title, it would be hers, <laughs> a management person. Um, and we were like, look at these two women. They're, they're super strong and they're super smart and they're really confident. And so we must be doing it right, right? Because these are the people that are available. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of an organizational bias uh, that we feel like, well, we're doing a pretty good job because as far as we can tell, we're not discriminating. Um, and I, I don't think it was all that long ago uh, that it, it became apparent to me in a couple of interactions um, that uh, Deepa and Nid and um, other women who work at Nalenso, um made it pretty explicit in a, a more, a looser conversation setting than this, uh, maybe over lunch, I don't remember, but a admitted that there are a number of situations where they do not feel comfortable actively pursuing uh, the, the feminist line of the conversation, where, where that is the, as far as this year is concerned, right? This is the thing, it's, it's a moving target, so in 1950, if you wanted to pursue feminism, you had a certain approach and you had a certain limit to what you could do before you started pushing people away or before you started throwing yourself so far out of the norm that no one would listen to you. And now it's 2018 and you have a certain extent that you can go and it's not the whole distance, right? You can't just be like, we need this all the time and we need to push really hard and this should be our number one agenda. You, you can't do that. There, there are limits to how loudly you can speak out and I think that, um, to respond to what Deepa was saying, that women should encourage themselves to look at themselves and speak up more loudly, um, that, that's, that's kind of self-feeding, right? Like we should be 
listening more carefully if someone says that they're uncomfortable, if someone says that they're unhappy, if someone says that they feel like there is a sexist situation occurring, we should listen really carefully because it takes ages and multiple occurrences for a person to actually open their mouth on those topics uh, if they're the one who could be perceived as being in the wrong. Um, and in 2018, that's still the case. Um, I actually had a couple of other uh, topics leading on from here for the, re for the rest of the panel. But uh, I think I'm going to stop uh, here so that we have something on our mind, you know, uh, to think about after the conference. So we are still well over the time, but... Okay, Vishal has a closing comment. So, uh, as most of you have already mentioned, this is a much, much larger thing to think of. And uh, you cannot separate one large issue from other large issues because they are all related. And uh, as it seems, this is about sensitivity. Sensitivity is about education. Education, by, by that I mean it's uh, developing a greater sen uh, sense of sensitivity. So, this goes towards... Uh, resource intensive system that we have gone to and at a, at a micro level what we can do is we can try to have every female friend of ours at least become a feminist if not every male friend of us uh, then at a macro level try to look for a possibility for greater education and by that I mean including things like stopping population explosion. Now this goes to a very, very broad thing, but you cannot really separate a broad thing from other broad things. That's what I'm trying to communicate. That's all. <laughs> Thanks, Vishal. And <laughs> I think we're all going to have a lot of things to say about this. And I'll, like, I'm actually surprised that um, 30 minutes past the closing time of the conference, we're all still here and very attentively listening. So, I mean, this is encouraging to me. So, I mean, thank you all so much.